Thank you all for coming. I'm very pleased to introduce Hao Dong, who's a postdoc at the Center of Contemporary uh, China at Princeton, uh, where he works primarily with Yuxia uh, this year and last year. He's also affiliated, of course, with Princeton's Office of Population Research and their Department of Sociology. He got his PhD earlier this year from, um, from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. His research broadly concerns social demography, especially family, kinship, migration, and health, and also uh, social stratification and mobility. A lot of his work takes a comparative, uh, comparative perspective and tries to understand how social and family contexts shape individual behaviors. His work has appeared in all the best journals, demography, demographic research, evolution and human behavior, social science and medicine, and others that I, I won't go on listing. And if that's not enough, he's also an accomplished violinist. Um, you should go to his website, it's very nice. Uh, but he does not have uh, an MPC seminar series mug until now. So, congratulations. I'll Thank leave you. this for you. Not like <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share some ongoing research here. So um, I've been doing a lot about uh, historical demography, but then since I got invitation here, and I think why not just take a risky move and present something to show our highest respect and admiration about EPUMs. So actually this work <laughs> is something based on uh, the current projects I'm doing with Yuxie, and uh, based on census data and other kinds of data. And uh, all the census data about China actually I got from EPUMS. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, so the title changed a little bit because we find that actually we can probably trace a little back further. So, um, but it's still the same uh, with the abstract. Okay, so let me start with this picture. And it is not a matching band. <laughs> um, it's, uh, a large group of uh, happy people that are going to be get married together. And why they're gathered in the stadium is actually because they're all the alumni of the university called Zhejiang University, which is where I went to college. And we're very, very proud of this ceremony that's annual, that a lot of uh, alumni get married, choose to get married here, regardless, like uh, they later have a very different occupations and also they may come back and join this and uh, even in their later ages. So um, I know that demographers are not scared of uh, population density like this, so I, I, I would like to show you more. Um, and this is, looks better since you don't need to um, stand in the open air. And so it's really a lot. And people are getting married with similar um, kind of educational attainment. Uh, pre that's pretty common now in China too. And so, uh, as you can see, it's full of this picture. And in 2016, in this single university, I think uh, there were, uh, in that ceremony, there were kind of 400 couples getting married, joining this ceremony. And uh, it's quite competitive. And this morning when I went over the slides for the last time, so I found my, uh, my best friend here, actually. <laughs> I didn't notice that before, this, uh, this boy waving the hand. And uh, we, we're really in a very good relationship. <laughs> and, and so I heard that to, because the slots are so competitive and limited, so uh, you need to find a way to other people to get in and to keep some others kind of away from this year and to roll them into the next year. So the one thing they are trying to encourage the students is GPA. So if you get better GPA, you rank higher, and you, it's more easier to get in. So apparently I made friends with some good students when I was in college. Um, okay, so that's the anecdote part. But the, the theoretical motivation is actually what we're talking about in this assault meeting. And the definition is largely, uh, we're talking about marriage of a couple with similar characteristics. And since we are doing uh, more about social science, that usually we're talking, when we're talking about that, it's about a, social, a similar social economic characteristics. And uh, it's kind of a very central topic and has long been uh, popular in the literature of social stratification and demography. And why is that? It's because first of all, that's an indicator for like how hard people can go across the boundary of different social classes. And if two people from different social classes can get married, that's a sign that's a good sign that, okay, there are some openness in the society. 
And also, because marriage is actually not a matter of simply two individuals getting together, but also they have the families uh, in behind supporting them. So intergenerationally, actually, that means accumulation of wealth or resource from two sides of families. And if you get that kind of matching going on, so you may get kind of acceleration in terms of inequality or things. So that's kind of one intergenerational implication. And also, when the couple get married and probably kind of uh, um, have a similar social economic status in the first place, they may have a, a they may have children, and usually there is a differential fertility across different kind of social classes, and that may also shape the later in, uh, social inequality in general in the next generation, and so on. So that's why kind of assaulting mating is still one um, kind of central topic, and that's why we are um, trying to study that. So the roadmap of my talk is, uh, the first one is I will very, very briefly to introduce like a based on the existing literature, the shaping mechanisms of uh, assaulting mating, like why people uh, kind of uh, doing this. Uh, and then I propose, uh, I introduce some methodological challenges based on the empirical data to show that why it is difficult and challenging to study the very long-term uh, trends in educational assaulting mating. And then we propose a uh, approach. It's nothing new, but it's kind of simple. Um, and finally, we will apply that uh, new approach to study the case of China, and uh, we will show, examine the general trends based on census microdata and also uh, nationally representative sur uh, survey data. And also, uh, we will try to compare that with con conventional log-linear model approach, because that's still dominant in uh, studying assaulting mating. Um, and uh, plus some other sensitivity analysis. So finally, it's a so what question. It's like, okay, so we're talking about educational study mating, especially in China, then why should we study that? How important exactly it is? So we will compare the importance of education against the uh, one of the most substantial social divide in China, which is the uh, urban rural uh, hukou status thing. So I'll introduce that to, uh, in detail later. Okay, oh, so, um, uh, if you have any uh, clarification questions, you're, uh, please feel free to ask, and I'm happy to, um, to answer. Okay. So basically, education, th there are many dimensions of social economic status that may lead to assaulting mating. Uh, education is arguably the most important and best study dimension. Uh, in the social economic, st uh, economic status in the assaulting mating literature. And here I just list three uh, very good literature review about the, uh, the field. But actually you can find way more very good papers and um, with a lot of great <coughs> ideas. Um, so talking about shaping mechanisms, the first one is the opportunity side. Um, so you have general social structure that kind of uh, provide the context of people like the, their social class, the, even the composition of those. And most importantly, the education, or especially recently if we're looking at the, in the long term, the change in educational structure, uh, is, uh, especially the expansion, that's very common globally. So that may also shape people's chance uh, to marry another one with good education. Right. Before, it's like oh, uh, the majority of population was illiterate, but now you have people starting into a very different category of educational attainment. So that generates opportunity. And the other one is a local marriage market. And that's an analogy, but basically it's like people matching with uh, each other when they, uh, uh, when they meet, right? They have to meet and then get married. Um, it's not really true nowadays, but uh, still uh, for the majority of time. Uh, so, for example, uh, Ron Mayer's paper have uh, highlights the importance of uh, school, uh, especially the university or college, as a venue for people of uh, highly ad for as a venue for highly educated people to meet, and that may contribute to the general trends of uh, uh, education uh, assaulting mating. But also, on the other hand, there is a preference. So the preference, like given the opportunity, some people may take it, some some other people may not. Uh, they have different rationale and different reason to take it. So the first one is actually recently we, we've been seeing a lot of the uh, evidence about the increasing access and increasing importance of education, 
especially if you're talking about the economic return of education, that's kind of one of the most powerful predictor for uh, economic return is education. Oh, uh, what happened? Okay, and uh, and that's one thing. So on the other hand, um, there's increasing female labor participation, and also when you, when female joins the labor market, they also they're smart, they earn money, and they can contribute to the family too. So that basically gives female more kind of uh, power and. Uh, uh, for, for others to consider in the market. And finally, many scholars think uh, the assaulting mating uh, is actually a process of status attainment, right? People care not only their own attainment of status, but also they would like to maximize the status of their couple, and that's for the overall well-being of the family. And with increasing labor participation and increasing education of females, so they always want to find a, a kind of highly educated wife. And when everybody has that preference, you have the computation, and they, that will kind of sort people actually matching with each other. Um, and also, on the other hand, uh, some others argue there is a cultural affinity, which means that people attending uh, high school may share similar interests, and also people get higher education, may have similar taste about things like going concert together, all right? whether that's rock concert or that's classical concert, and different people have different tastes, and that may contribute to why people finally make a decision to get married with each other. One thing, though, is not uh, much discussed in the literature is the impact of historical events. Uh, so I'm talking about kind of dramatic events that may shift either the uh, social structure itself or shift people's preference about studying. So recently, there have been some emerging uh, studies, very good ones. Uh, so I, I list two. The first one is about the effects of joining uh, join World War II and following the later GI Bill about the increasing education of the veterans and then how that kind of additional <coughs> education may change the uh, assaulting mating patterns in the US. And they found that that's uh, kind of a, a significant contribution to the change in the American assaulting mating pattern. And there's also one paper about China that talking about the cultural revolution which uh, distilled the education attainment structure in general in China. And also they found that that leads to a lower, a drop in the assaulting mating pattern and then later there is a revival of that. So I will touch that too because our findings uh, coincide with that one. Um, okay. okay, so um, let me talk about the challenges. Um, of course we are hoping to solve this, but let me put the <laughs> challenger first. Uh, so the first thing is educational <coughs> expansion. And that's, as I just said, is common. Uh, the magnitude may differ, but it's kind of common recently uh, in the past century or so for almost, uh, uh, for many societies. And uh, what that means is that may make comparison, meaningful comparison between cohorts about their education attainment kind of hard or challenging. Why is like before, Kind of in the first cohort, that's 1910, you got majority like illiterate, and then later only some people, only some people got primary school education, and then they are actually kind of already better edu among the better educated, right? But later, if you look at the later cohorts, actually a lot more people overall got a shifted, uh, got a shifted in the educational structure upwardly. So what that means is like the uh, the meaning of specific absolute educational categories may differ across cohorts along the expansion of education. And what makes things worse to study education of starting mating is that we also have gender gap, and that gender gap changes. So <coughs> there, the, the evolution of, uh, of educational expansion is, differ, uh, is different between uh, men and women. This is it. So you can see still, you see the expansion, but on the other hand, so the initial composition is different, and finally they kind of converge. And this is based on China's case. Uh, so for, for the US, it's uh, much more similar between genders, but still you may get into this kind of problem if you study other developing countries. What this tells us, or questions, is kind of traditionally, if we define homogamy, we tend to define, okay, people of same educational category marry each other. So, and this is what this, like, so we are taking an example about the, the husband born in 1930, 
and a wife born in 1932. And both of those are, uh, have education at a primary school level. And, but is this really a perfect match <laughs> if you're talking about the uh, kind of rank, relative ranking in the population? Probably not, or at least ask some question about this kind of definition. And so that means the meaning of homogamy across cohorts during educational expansion may change, right? And because if you compare similar educational attainment in later cohorts, that's pretty much similar and flat. And the other example is what if we have, again, another husband from the cohort 1930 who have a um, middle school education, marry a wife with a primary education. That's by absolute sense, that's actually marrying down for the male. But actually, if you're talking about the relative ranking within the cohort, it's actually kind of flat. So <coughs> this also tells us, it's like the meaning of hypogamy, male hypogamy, uh, may also change across cohorts. And I didn't do the uh, female hypogamy or, or uh, the other way around is because, uh, at least in China, that's minority. It's not very much happen uh, quite often. Okay, so that's kind of challenge for us to study the very long-term trend because the assumption of this may change and also the structure changes. And so that means when you do log linear models, that may require some kind of more thinking about the assumptions underlying when you think that's a uniform association <coughs> or something. Or even you do crossing models, you are basically assuming the category, the difference between categories may mean something more or less the same across years, those kind of things. Um, but anyway, so that's the empirical methodological challenge to study the long-term trends. So uh, what we are trying to do is an exercise that um, trying to develop a, um, adapt a simpler uh, approach that is based on the relative ranking. And so what we, do um, briefly is basically we will first rank the educational attainment of each individual uh, relative to the same gender peers from the same birth cohort. In that way, you get a relative ranking, and that may help us to have some comparable measures of the education regarding the kind of the dramatic edu uh, educational expansion. And also, um, if we later have different categories of education for each, uh, for each birth cohort, that may also account for that. Because all you end up with is a percentile. And that percentile is kind of scale free in a way. Uh, although there are some other uh, problems with that. But uh, so far, that's uh, the main argument. And, and also, um, in that sense, that's before you do the estimation. Because when you do a log linear model, you're trying to control this kind of marginal distribution uh, within the model itself. And in this way, it's kind of simpler, it's a two-step. Uh, and so after we do that, uh, it's very pretty uh, straightforward. It's like we can estimate the rank rank correlation or regression <coughs> slopes. And so because we can, uh, if we do regression, then it's possible to actually include other confounding factors. And we think it's also a better use of the increasingly available micro-level data, especially like APAMS or other like European, um, European data and also increasingly in Asia. So that's a better use of that instead of just doing tabulation uh, and uh, uh, contagious and table analysis. And also, this is even more powerful when you're trying to do comparison between countries where, where you have very different coding for educational attainment and other things. At least you have some standard uh, kind of uh, measure to compare between each country and get rid of those uh, inconsistent coding thing. So you may already recognize this is similar to the rationale or to the approach of uh, Rock Chatty, uh, Grasky, and others on income mobility uh, in the States. And uh, although this, this kind of uh, thinking, the relative ranking is nothing new, but uh, they really made that popular and got attention a lot. And, uh, that's, and also we think that's really a smart way to use this kind of approach to, uh, to uh, overcome a lot of uh, limitations. And also, um, recently, also, um, so Sison from Chicago, Yuxie, my co-author, and Joe Ferry um, and others, also uh, they apply a similar method but to study the occupational, uh, intergenerational occupational mobility in the states. And they also make heavy use of uh, census data and trying to trace back to the very long term, back to 1850 or something. And so um, this study 
we basically, this is our <coughs> first run about this method and trying to develop that for the assaulting mating studies. And we also are trying to see if we can have a better understanding about the trends in China. And uh, because we know China relative better, and also we have now multiple sources of data that we can do comparison. So basically, we want, we want to validate if this really works. Um, and this is also part of a uh, kind of bigger project that uh, I am doing with Yuxie. And we are trying to apply this and then comparing the very long term trends in not only assaulting mating, but also intergenerational mobility, both along the educational dimension, like uh, in uh, North America, Europe, and uh, East Asia. Okay. Do you do the analysis with and without the relative ranking? I mean, it seems to me like uh, I see the reason you need it. Yep. But, uh, to me, that's a big part of the story, the expansion of education uh, and how it's expanded to males first and, and females later. If you do the relative ranking, aren't you kind of missing some of that? I mean. Um, I think that's a fair, fair point. Then uh, the, the difference is basically the focus of study. It's like, are you really interested in the, a, getting a comparable long-term trends or are you really interested in this structure shift on people's uh, specific behavioral pattern? Yeah. So I, I, but I, I do see that's a, that's a very good point. Um, yeah. Oh. Um, do you, in the US it seems like women are usually younger than the man they marry. Mm -hmm. Is that true in China? And do you think that affects how you're doing it by cohort at all? Or? Yes. That may, uh, may affect that, and uh, that's why actually even we have uh, very large scale micro data, we focus that like 10 year cohort, that hopefully may get a lot of people, a lot of couples in the same cohort. Yeah, but that's a, that's a true thing. And what adds more to the complication is that the age homogamy itself changes along with time. So uh, probably, uh, I think, uh, and also, but the, the good thing about this is I, I did try to change, uh, to control for the age or something, basically for fun to try if that changed things or not. Not really. So uh, that's a short answer. But that's also an important one. Okay. So the data we're using for this study is uh, the um, China Census microdata, the first three weeks, the 1982, 1990, and 2000. And that's the only available microdata to us so far. And uh, we are trying to work with uh, uh, Status Bureau in China to get a uh, calculation with <coughs> more recent waves done, uh, but it's uh, in process. Um, and also, we want to confirm our findings and get more information later. So we will use some nationally representative social sample, uh, social survey. Uh, the first one is the, the first one actually ever in China done by uh, Andrew Water, uh, Ivan Lini, and, uh, and uh, Dan Chaiman. And that's a very good one. It's 1996, so that's the earliest we can get. And and also we have the China General Social Survey data with similar template with the General Social Survey data in the states. And we have a, a recently uh, available China Family Panel studies, and that's uh, one of the biggest one and with most complete information about all the family members in the household, which helps us to get information for both the spouse and uh, uh, for both the husband and wife. So, and we focus on prevailing marriage because we have data kind of relatively recent, but we really want to study the trends back to uh, early cohorts. But uh, uh, so the couples of age 25 to 75, um, I understand that's a little old for the 20, uh, 75 couples, but that's the best we can do. And we will try to have some sensitivity analysis about the selection of those people. And, mm -hmm. and but one good thing, uh, about studying the Chinese marriages is on the one hand, there is universal marriage. So uh, the selection into marriage is not that uh, big compared uh, with the European or, or American context. On the other hand, there is really a low divorce rate until very, very recently. And even recently, the magnitude is really low. So that means uh, it's, there, there shouldn't be that much difference between the pretty willing marriage and first marriage. So first one, uh, so this, uh, I provide more details about the ranking. So firstly, we will obtain the birth cohort and gender specific distribution of educational attainment based on census microdata. And uh, so we will do that uh, by getting the midpoint percentile rank for each attainment categories. For example, if 40% of the whole cohort, uh, like uh, 
of males are illiterate, then everybody got an average like 20% of that rank. And basically, they're meaning that they're the top, bottom 20% educated. And also, we, uh, as I just said, we will do the 10-year birth cohort. Hopefully, we can get most of couples in or, or uh, don't miss that much. Um, and we center that on the uh, decadal years. And for, uh, so it's kind of easy to interpret. And also, that very nicely covers some major events happen in China, in Chinese history, uh, like Cultural Revolution. And, uh, and we base our ranking um, seven absolute categories of education attainment. So from illiterate to primary school, middle school, high school, professional <coughs> associate, and college. And finally, uh, <coughs> finally, for the two recent waves, we also have grad students. Um, okay. And also, g given that we have three waves of census data, so for some cohorts, they are overlapping. So we have multiple waves of data. So the uh, criteria for us to choose is actually we will choose the data point when the cohort are closest to their age 30s and 40s. In that way, they're still robust. And also, they already finished their, uh, most of them already finished their uh, higher education. So we got relatively stable um, estimation. So um, that's the details. But still not perfect, because we only have three waves. So for, uh, for the 18, 1982 data, that need to, uh, we need to get those data um, for the very early cohorts. So for the main analysis, we basically, after we get the distribution, then we can assign the relative ranks to individuals in uh, census microdata or any kinds of individual level data according to their gender, their birth cohort, and education attainment. And then so after that, we will estimate the capital rank rank correlation and, and also slope. So the estimation is actually very simple. Just the OLS regression with standards coefficient. And uh, if we also add other controls, that, be, that becomes a slope. Uh, if we don't add other controls, that um, mathematically that's equal to correlation. So, um, and also if we do slope, we trying to control something. Uh, and currently, we are including the model is the fixed effects of age and also data set. Given that different data set may still have some some unobserved systematic differences that we may not know. Um, and because we have large enough data, and we want to gather uh, correlation first. Uh, so we do separate estimation for each cohort. So it's not like all the data in one uni uh, unified uh, uh, regression model, but just so we do that separately for each cohort. So these are the findings. And uh, because we, uh, we don't have information, complete information for marriage years, so the x axis is uh, birth cohort. So it's still <coughs> birth cohort. Um, and the size of the markers are relative to the size of uh, available data in that cohort. And the, this solid black line is based on the census microdata. And what we can see on the f from the first side is actually uh, the males and the females are pretty similar. And overall, there is an increasing trend with exceptions. Like uh, there is something probably happened between the uh, 1950s and the 60s. So I will. Um, tell you later what happened. Um, also, because we have nationally representative sampling data, so we want to confirm with other data sources to make sure. And then the, this green line, green line is based on the uh, census, uh, based on the survey data. And overall, that looks similar, the trend. And also, uh, but the thing is because all the survey data available only in late years, so we cannot get the uh, very early cohorts. What we do is we get, if data available, we get the parents of the surveyed respondents to see if their uh, kind of assaulting mating patterns somehow query, uh, kind of in line with what we observe with the census data. And that's, of course, if you talking about the uh, representativeness, that may kind of produce a very kind of uh, special population got represented. But still, that's a bad thing we can do. And we, we simply want to get a sense about uh, what's going on. So this is the blue line is based on the parent sample uh, we got from the survey data. And this is our um, confidence interval. So uh, well, more or less, uh, we are finding similar trend that you firstly got an increase up to 1940 cohort, and then a little drop, 50, 60 cohort, and then goes back again. 
and uh, increase. Okay. Um, well, if you have questions, you're free to ask. Okay. Um, okay. Then just move on. And so, what happened between 1950 and 60? That's actually um, is uh, is cultural revolution. And during that time, college and universities closed uh, until 1970. So the that's a 10-year kind of period, and for the first half, uh, all the universities closed, and then the college entrance exam was also canceled and replaced by a nomination or recommendation system that uh, basically your um, commune or your collective units can nominate you if you behave well, you do very good work in uh, farming and labor, that actually you may get a chance. Or simply you are in a uh, very good relationship with the leader of that, so anyway, so it's not it's less objective and less equal about of uh, getting into this uh, college, and also uh, many intellectuals, academics, educators were sent to rural labor camps or uh, simply uh, persecuted, and that also has uh, effects on about people's perceivedness uh, about how people perceive the value of education and things going on. So to young people. Okay, uh, of course, as a result, opportunities and standards of higher education uh, deceased, uh, decreased. So for those urban youth, many of those are volunteered or forced to move to rural area according to the policy of the central leadership. And also, uh, f especially for those educated or social elite, uh, their children kind of got some additional barrier to get nominated to, into this uh, college or some other things. But uh, the good thing, is uh, the basic education did get improved a lot. So you got a kind of massive uh, expansion about the basic education, but kind of very limited uh, chance of uh, higher education. And also, it would be hardly surprising to see anything that people uh, changes in people's mind about the preference and the kind of uh, uh, about the importance of education in their life. So. And, and those two cohorts are actually attending school during this time. So that's wh what we think that is, might be a very important thing. Um, okay, so also we, we're trying to make sure if the, what we just estimated are kind of uh, not very sensitive to the things we can come up with. <coughs> so firstly, we want to get a better understanding of how that is similar or different from log linear models. And we try this unidiff model that's uh, uh, two different names, but uh, it's uh, essentially the same model, um, and uh, and also came up with the same in the same year. So we will firstly do a general unit diff model that assumes that uh, there is a kind of common association pattern pattern between wives and husbands' education, and what differ between cohorts is basically uh, the strengths of that general uh, association pattern. So uh, some years people may get more uh, strongly associated uh, with each other, then that's more assaulting mating. On, uh, well, if the other way around, then the, there's less assaulting mating. And also, we will further compare uh, to add parameters for homogamy. And finally, we will add additional parameters for hypogamy to allow the meaning of homogamy and hypogamy differ uh, between cohorts. So we have something more, it's basically, so say, okay, so now we are basically trying to do something with continuous measure of education. What if we simply use uh, years of schooling instead of relative ranking? And, uh, and we will try to see if there's a selection about the data, um, basically because we are using only limited waves of data and trying to get a sense of very old and very young age of cohorts, so the survival biases may happen and also there could be, uh, for the very young cohorts, uh, not many, um, not everybody got married already, so we want to get a sense about how that kind of selection may change our results. And finally, we will do this, uh, uh, this kind of compare the importance of education attainment with uh, uh, this rural urban hukou origin, and we're trying to do a kind of small exercise with uh, canonical correlation analysis to see. Okay, so this is comparison with log linear models, and this is a simple unitive model that we apply to the uh, to the uh, to the data to the census microdata, and then if we further allow uh, 
if we further add parameters for homogamy, that is the cells on the diagonal, and also allowing them to change between cohorts. Basically, it's like we're allowing uh, homogamy of different educational attainment to differ um, <coughs> and also allow to further differ between cohorts. That's what this do. So then we kind of get a uh, drop similar to the, uh, what we just estimated is a drop about the 1950, uh, 1950 cohort. And, but this, this is still not a general increase in trend. So what happened if we further add parameters to allow homogamy, the meaning of homogamy to differ across cohort, then we actually get a kind of similar trend to what we estimate uh, from the relative ranking approach. But then, so if we really consider uh, what this kind of additional parameters mean uh, to the estimation is basically a very simple assumption to what we did with the relative ranking. Basically, it's like you know there, the meaning of homogamy cha may change, and also the meaning of hypogamy, male hypogamy may also change across cohort. So once you adjust for that, actually the, um, it produced very similar results with the uh, relative ranking method. But the thing is, uh, uh, so many, very often that we may not sure, pretty sure the assumptions are really correct, or what if uh, there are some uh, other things happen that we do not exactly know. So it's better to have different methods to confer. Okay, and then we can try the years of schooling as a positive uh, continu continuous measure of educational attainment. And the black line, again, is based on the rank-rank correlation, a uh, rank-rank slope. And then the, uh, the blue line is the school year. So they are very similar, actually. And also, um, but you tend to a little bit overestimate the correlation or uh, the correlation of starting mating. And uh, if you think about this, they are actually either the schooling, years of schooling, all the kind of relative rank are not really continuous, right? And especially for the years of schooling, that's still categorical because if you get elite free, you, go, you get zero years of schooling and uh, so on. So, so the thing is when you follow the very early cohort, then you get a lot of people with, again, so probably zero, zero or one years of schooling matching each other, but in fact, their relative ranking may differ a lot. So you, that's why you get more, relatively more assaulting mating discovered by the relative rank measure. But overall, kind of uh, produce a very similar trend. Um, so this is about the potential selection binds. So what we do is basically compare the cohorts with different waves of census and separate them. So then, Basically, for the same cohort, we get data of their different ages. And then we can see if older ages of the same cohort produce kind of uh, different estimates compared with uh, their early ages. So this is what happened. So the black, the, uh, the black dot is the earliest census we can get, meaning that the group, uh, the cohorts in, with the black dot are, the, uh, are their youngest age. And then when, the, when you goes up, Actually, that means uh, at their older ages. So what you can say is basically, um, when people are getting older, that at least in the case of China, that may produce kind of overestimation about assaulting mating. That may have something to do with the survival selection uh, according to education or something. But at least based on data, this simple thing may tell us that. And also, because considering that uh, the latest cohort is 1980, <coughs> and we are using the census of 2000, which means that people at that time is only uh, their early 20s or something, and not many may get marriage, given, given that the, that is below the average, uh, medium age and marriage in China. So, so that's, uh, oops, that's similar. So we got actually another drop for the very, very young cohort, meaning that if, uh, so there, there might be some kind of underestimation for the inclusion, uh, for, for those very young cohort. So, but overall, if you take this into, account, then probably what we saw this increasing could be even steeper. Uh, and uh, we think probably we are at the safe side. Um, okay, and because we find very similar patterns for the, based on the wife's birth cohort, so I didn't highlight those. I think a little lost there. Yep. You're using prevailing marriages, which are really wide age groups, right? Yes. For multiple censuses. Uh, you didn't overlap them initially, but now you are, right? So yes. Okay, and the difference is because why? Because you said there's very little divorce and remarriage going on and very little more educational attainment 
after the age of marriage. Right. Uh, I think most analysis that do this, I see, try to focus on newlyweds, so you don't get into this issue. So right. what causes this bias again? I think, uh, especially for the older cohort, that's because they were getting very old. Right, it's like a so memory issues of like the no the oh, mortality, so mortality. the okay. survival thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, and because yeah. if we're doing a Saudi mating, you need to have both wife and husband in the survey and uh, right. still alive, and that may have something. Uh, so the older they get, the, the fewer you may end up with. So that's the thing we want to understand this survival bias. And for the very young cohort, that's the same. So you need to get both people, both the couple at the same day similarly young age and got married and included in this sample. So that may also create some other selection bias. Yeah, so okay. while we're on it, uh, after the Cultural Revolution, is there makeup education after 1976 or something that you don't see otherwise? Maybe people are uh, going a little longer in school or not? Uh, not very much actually for those cohorts. Well, that's why those uh, were, were called, somebody called those lost generation. Um, as well, so uh, because they already missed a chance and they end up, um, they, they start working and uh, and other things going on. So, right. Okay. So the final one is can education compensate the uh, rural urban thing. So why we choose this again is because we want to understand whether since we are studying education as well mating, but whether education is really a very important factor that to study the Chinese marriages. And, and the, we think one very good benchmark is this rural urban uh, hukou status thing. And that basically defines the social structure. Uh, structure. And, and also that is, uh, means a lot of entitlement and all kinds of rights if you are away from your residency. But if you are with, uh, with either your registered residency in the rural areas or urban areas, there's also a dramatic differences in terms of uh, economic well-being and also opportunities. And so, so we still think the hukou is one of the most important things that we can com uh, compare with education. Of course, the meaning of hukou also changes. The policy is not the same all the time, but still that's very important. So we want to check if, uh, if later education can make people catch up. Um, so, and also, uh, let me see if I covered all the things. Oh, about the, the cartoon, this is uh, the four Chinese characters are Beijing, the capital city, Hukou. So that means basically, if you have that Hukou, you can buy an apartment in, in Beijing, and, if, and also you can guide your student, uh, you, you can guide your children into the public schooling system. Without that, it's uh, very hard. And uh, I have some friends who, who, ha uh, who migrate to Beijing and teach, but um, because uh, the, her da his daughter is uh, with Hong Kong's uh, identity, so actually she needs to pay a lot to get her into the international school or something. But basically, all I want you to try to see is the uh, hukou status really matters to a lot of things, access to all kinds of resources. And, uh, <coughs> uh, and there, there have been some anecdotes about like people may simply, uh, people may really kind of emphasize the importance of hukou when they make a decision about who they're going to marry. And uh, especially the apartment is getting kind of uh, more and more expensive. And uh, so it's a very important thing to think about. So what we do is this uh, kind of a canonical correlation analysis. It's basically, uh, it's conceptually that's just a, as a association between two sets of variables instead of just a, if you do bivariate correlation, that's two variables. So now we are doing two sets of variables. And we get that from this, uh, Basically, the estimation would be kind of maximize the correlation between the two sets of variable. And essentially, what they do is assuming instead of the observed, uh, like two variables or multiple variables, you have latent variables for each set. And here is a latent variable for husband and latent variable for wife. And then, so we do that correlation and compare if there is a linear loading. The weight of different factors may differ a lot. And we focus on the, we use the CIPS data, um, the survey data, because that's the only, uh, that's the biggest data and uh, that we have both spaces are, are uh, surveyed. And also one more expect, uh, important thing is the hukou status may change when people go to, uh, get a social degree or college degree. So it's better to use something before they get that. Um, so that's why the CIPS provides available uh, hukou status at age three. That's its ideal for this analysis. Okay, so this is uh, 
comparison, and this is basically you can regard this as coefficients uh, from regression of the weights of the different things. So the solid line is the uh, the weight of uh, the importance of education that basically drops. Uh, firstly, drop at that point, and that's uh, now the uh, y the x axis is based on marriage cohort. So we also want to confirm if uh, based on the birth cohort and marriage cohort we find similar findings for similar people. And then, so that's essentially the, the cohorts we find and uh, who attending education, uh, who attending schools in cultural revolution. But, but so there's a, so after that there's an increase in the solid line. So the education gets more and more important. And on the other hand, the importance of who code gets decreased. This crossover is artificial because I have a different Y scale and they differ a lot. But, uh, but the general trends are there. And also, if we ask can education compensate rural origin, so before 1990, it's almost impossible because you got a kind of a linear loading of around three for Hukou, but very tiny, uh, very tiny in the beginning. It's like a 0 0.01. Uh, for education, it's like you multiply by a hundred. That's a percentile, the full scale percentile. Still, you cannot catch the importance of Hukou. Uh, but later, we can see actually that takes around forty percent point for males to uh, compensate if they're from rural origin. So uh, it's a uh, and similar patterns for females as well. And it's probably even easier for females to catch up with uh, better education. And this increase in period is actually, uh, there are some things happening basically that's relaxing hukou re uh, restrictions and also marketization makes education becoming more and more important. And also there's a uh, rapid economic growth that generate a lot of opportunities for people and to value their education and get employed. Uh, so, okay, so that's the conclusion. So we trying to propose a simpler uh, approach to the assaulting mating research and we find a, uh, overall increase in trend in salt mating in China in the uh, spanning the almost the whole 20th century, and uh, we also find exceptions about the Cultural Revolution uh, about the cohorts who attending school at um, uh, attend school during uh, and also marrying right marrying right after the Cultural Revolution. So uh, the final discussion is actually we think probably given all this analysis we think the increase in salt mating marriage. Uh, so there are two stages of that increase and driven by different shaping mechanisms. So the before one, given that the educational structure and expansion uh, of uh, educational attainment was so dramatic, <coughs> it's more driven by this opportunity uh, thing that people now can marry a person with better educational attainment. Um, but the later one is more about preference, given that we have very similar uh, and kind of a uh, a very similar structure of the educational attainment for both men and women, and also it's more kind of uh, equally distributed. And uh, given that we compare that with hukou, that people do value educations more. So we think it's probably more related to kind of preference changes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, My former student who's now at Boston College, when Pan looked at um, uh, returning to school after the Cultural Revolution and found especially that men did return to school. So that could affect your relative um, mating, um, a sort of mating. It would no longer be the same if, if the men went back to school and their wives did. But the second thing is I was wondering about this what's it called, Hoku or whatever? Yeah, Hoku, right. Is that, if, if one of you has it, do you get the benefits if one, one member of the family has it? Or do both have to have it for the daughter to go to school or for you to get a nice apartment? Okay, thank you. Um, both are very good uh, questions. Uh, the first one actually is uh, because we rank people within their birth cohort and within the same gender. So if the so if the people after cultural revolution, the males going back to school and a lot of those, so still the relative ranking may get rid of that. And especially because we focus our current data based on the 30s and 40s, if possible, 
uh, only if they, after that period still, like at, at their age 40, 50, if they're coming back to school, that may affect this, uh, what, what we are observing here. And then um, for the second one, the full cold thing, that's complicated because depending on what kind of out outcome or benefits you're talking about. But the basic thing is uh, the most substantial difference would be where you want to live. It's in an urban area or it's in a rural area, right? So. Uh, only if you marry, uh, for, for females actually, uh, if you marry an urban person, of course you you're tend to uh, stay in the urban areas. That, that would mean something to those uh, rural, rural girls. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Please. So, uh, was there a difference in a sort of, a sort of maybe mm -hmm. between rural and urban areas? Like, I would, I would think that the opportunity to marry somebody, I mean, if, if most people have very low levels of education in the rural area, your your um, your supply of potential partners is limited by education. Thank you. Actually, that's that's a part I I, I forgot to mention. Um, so the thing is, before that, people uh, before nineteen eighties uh, around, uh, Hukou was really restricted, and people have to stay there. But after that period, <coughs> given this rapid economic growth and uh, kind of kind of relax a little bit. So a lot of rural Hukou, um, young people actually get a chance to go to the urban area and walk, and that's called floating population or whatever, the migrant walkers. And so they get better chance to meet all kinds of people. And uh, I, I would imagine that also kind of triggers that increase. That would be one kind of important mechanism. You know, they're, they're, uh, the pool that they find in a spouse is different than before. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, I, I've been looking at these figures in the U.S. and um, I actually have a whole bunch of questions, but let me uh, focus on the central one. Yep. One of the things we found is that the patterns of educational attainment differ by class and age. So if you look at women uh, who, for non-elite backgrounds, mm -hmm. below the 75th percentile uh, in terms of the income of the parents' generation, then you look at the girls uh, from the bottom 75 percent. Okay, mm -hmm. you're following me. Uh, yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> uh, they're better educated than the boys from the same families. But one of the factors that skews that is they are more likely to return to school at older ages. And so what happens is, since they're older, mm -hmm. and, and again, this is true for master's degrees as well as BAs. Since they're older, uh, they're more likely as well not to be residing on college campuses and not necessarily to be the same age as their classmates. Mm -hmm. So when you then look at the assortment of mating figures, you find this group is less likely to marry college graduate men than uh, even the uh, girls from, and I'm saying girls because we're talking about now age 17 to 18, go directly to college. Mm -hmm. uh, they really look different in terms of the relationship between age of education and whether or not the degree uh, results in better marriage opportunities. And that group that goes back to school later is much more likely not to marry at all. Mm -hmm. We have children without marrying and marrying later somebody is not father of children. So the implications for sort of in mating are quite different. And I'm wondering whether you have ways of testing that. Well, that's really a hard question. Um, uh, so uh, actually, recent weeks, we also started working on the US data and trying to do similar things. Um, but so far, we, we still focus on the general trend, so we didn't get into the details. But I, 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 I do think um, those details are especially about people like over the college education, the patterns may be very different, and they may, and assaulting mating of those people may not really mean assaulting mating. As long as you got into college and probably you meet your spouse in the college as well, and and that happens in China too. But um, for this case, largely um, Chinese people's marital behavior so far is more consistent, and they have less options compared with uh, less uh, less. Um, less patterns compared with the U.S. Uh, couples. But I think uh, that that's something we, we need to think about that. And I think basically, um, well to me, I think probably doing a subsample analysis, like uh, 
further break down this general national for all categories, but just simply focus on each, uh, each, uh, each educational attainment categories and do things like uh, crossing models some similar to those kind of rationale. That could help probably, yeah. Please, see. So <coughs> in your earliest cohort, you had 40% of the men are illiterate, so the median men is around 20th percentile. Right, it's even more And than that, so yeah. for the women, about 80% were illiterate, so the median would be about the 40th percentile. Yeah. So for those people who are illiterate husband, illiterate wife, do you assume that the, the, the men are marrying up? Uh, 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 or, um, you know. Uh, um, right. So, so that's a major. I mean, you've only got essentially, you got almost everybody among the women in the early cohorts in the bottom um, right. category. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that uh, if, uh, that also motivates us to work on the US data because you have more detailed educational categories. And the main issue with this method, especially dealing with broad categories, is like the lumping. It's like you have a lot of people having the same thing and then it's simply kind of, uh, because the category is too big, you end up with different uh, percentiles. That's true. Uh, just, but still, because if you look at this, still, I mean, like uh, illiterate males may have, uh, I mean, sorry, the illiterate females may have better chance to ma marry each other as compared with the other way around. So that thing, so still, if you think from that perspective, if we find illiterate male, illiterate female, and the ranking still kind of makes sense. But I agree that's a, that's a very severe um, problem with this. And the better detailed data you have, the, the better we can solve this problem. Yeah, currently it's still kind but of- But there's always gonna be lumping like finished primary school, finished high school, whatever, <coughs> you know. M most people are o o always gonna fall into a small number of categories, even if you have like single years of schooling. That, that, that could be possible. Yeah, but that kind of lumping is you cannot do that um, Anyway, I think just compare this with log linear models, we can already incorporate more categories than log linear models for the most of time. And then basically we are getting approached to something with better data available. But I, I, I do see that uh, it's a problem and it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one actually. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering about the, uh, the, the group in the, uh, you know, the time of the revolution when there's more assorted and uh, was a sort of, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it, it seems that they're ca they're kind of bucking trends because the uh, you know the tendency to marry someone who's of equal status is, is going down, and, uh, and so there are probably many unhappy people, <laughs> or there could be, and this is sort of beyond the scope of your uh, analysis. But I was just wondering if there were other um, you know trends or. Uh, that shows an increase. You could co comment on, uh, you know, the greater instability of the marriage, or maybe more um, intergenerational mobility, uh, because you know there's kind of more mixing at the mm -hmm. level. Yeah. Well, for those cohorts, if anything, that would be more intergenerational mm -hmm. immobility, because uh, you farmer and then um, the farmer, the farmer and the others may kind of get nominated more easily than the um, <coughs> social elites or something. Um, and uh, it's, education is not the channel for moving upward. Um, but um, I, I think that period, um, how to build that? So the, the hukou status and other, other things are actually getting important. And also there's, um, and anecdotally, because a lot of urban youth are sent down to the rural areas, and they have no choice because they're, they're really young and they're passion, um, passionate. So they, a, a lot of urban, well-educated um, boys are marrying uh, those uh, rural girls. And that may, of course, result in uh, marital instability later. But those kind of things only occurs recently or like 10 years later, like after they get a chance to move back to the urban area. So there are a lot of uh, sad story about that part. But uh, given this kind of approach, we can already detect that. Um, just, uh, yeah, require some further study, but um, yeah. I'll ask another question. Yes. The, um, what I understand is that during the Cultural Revolution, the kinds of, the, 
degrees that were given were not did not mean the same because they were it was a poor quality education. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that as part of your story that the meaning of education changed? So that I might have been nominated by my um, local yeah. commune to, to go to college, but I wasn't really getting a college education and so therefore in your data, it looks like I have a college education, and yet I'm marrying somebody, a junior college, with with um, who's illiterate. But mm -hmm. really, I was illiterate too. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I I can see that's a measurement problem that we don't really know if the measurement for that cohort is really comparable to other cohorts given the same absolute ed uh, education attainment, and and we just assume in this cohort experience similar quality of education, that's why we do relative ranking within those cohorts. Hopefully that even, okay, the, the, the education didn't mean the same thing, but they mean the same to the cohorts, and uh, hopefully that still get things through. So, so it's really kind of, so that's why I didn't provide a lot of uh, uh, social history in the, in the first, because I don't want that, that part get uh, distracted. Um, about from the main thing. So we're, we're basically trying to see uh, this kind of things helps to overcome some issues and increase the comparability across cohorts regardless, a lot of things. Like but we all got distracted by the cultural level. <laughs> I do, and after I find that, I think this, this would be a good paper. <laughs> Otherwise, it's boring. Yeah. We should end, but thank you very much. Thank you.